our hearts to be moved by your word, that we might leave this place with your wisdom implanted within us. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is from the Gospel of Luke. We're picking up right where we left off after last week's reading. In chapter 18, reading verses 9 through 14. Now remember last week we had a parable that Jesus taught to teach his disciples to persevere in prayer. Uh, The idea is not necessarily so much to persevere in prayer to get what we want from God, but instead to be transformed by the discipline of prayer. It's very much like um, an exercise uh, uh, plan or a new diet, for example. Uh, So when you get on a new diet or a new exercise plan, it transforms your body. Persistence in prayer transforms your spirit. So Jesus is telling another parable right on the heels of that for today's reading. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. Have any of you ever been a cat owner? Any of you ever owned a cat? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And have you ever tried to let your cat out of the house? So the cat's been bugging you for a while. It wants to go outside because there's something out there or there's just some need within the cat that it needs to be outdoors. And so it, it, it bugs you, it bothers you, it bothers you. Okay, fine, I'll let you out. So you go and you open the door and it peers out and sits down. Meanwhile, bugs and small vermin are coming in the house because you're still standing there like a doofus with the door open thinking the cat is actually going to go outside. Or... Once you finally get the cat outside, uh, it comes back after doing its cat thing, and then it bugs you again because now it wants back in. So you go and you open the door, and the cat looks at you and sits down. Sometimes cats have a real difficult time deciding whether or not they want to be in or out. Just as we have a difficult time determining whether or not our cat really wants in or out, we also have a little difficulty determining who is in and who is out in this parable. Because it's set up in a way that eventually turns things on its head and surprises us. On the face of it, the one who is in in this parable is the Pharisee. Larry Broding, who blogs at wordsunday.com, says that there is a sense of community status between these two people that Jesus presents in this parable. The Pharisees, these were the educated people in Jesus' time. They followed God's law, and following God's law meant doing God's will and peering into the mind of God. They spent a lot of time examining the law and considering how the law would work. Following the law perfectly meant fulfilling God's will perfectly, and then, therefore, getting that much closer to God. It's kind of like having a rope, and the more you pull on the rope, the closer you get to God. 
Because of their intricate knowledge of the law, Pharisees functioned as civic and religious leaders within the Jewish community. People depended on them for rulings on civil law and for spiritual comfort. So Pharisees had status and power in the eyes of the community. So if the Pharisee is the ultimate insider, the tax collector is the ultimate outsider. Since the tax collector worked for the occupying forces of Rome, he was considered a traitor. Looked upon as money leeches and opportunists, tax collectors are universally hated by the people. So you have this sense of community status in, in the, as, as this parable is set up. Broding also says there's physical location and body language that's different between the two of them. The Pharisees stood and prayed, hands up, eyes up. Stood has two meanings. Uh, one is that the Pharisee is standing up for what he believes. He's being very visible about what he's believing. He, he thanks God that God has separated him from the evil mass of humanity, robbers, sinners, adulterers, tax collectors. And since the Pharisee has defined what he was not, he continues to say to God, this is who I am, by saying what he did. Fasting twice a week, tithing everything he possessed, he goes beyond the letter of the law. When he did more than the law required, the Pharisee knew he was hauling on that rope and getting closer to God. On the other hand, the tax collector is off at a distance. He wouldn't even look up, and he would beat his breast, which is a gesture originally and usually associated with women. This is a very female thing, beating your breast. Unlike the proud Pharisee who could brag about his accomplishments, the tax collector had nothing but a broken heart to present to God. The only prayer the tax collector could make was a personal petition for mercy. One other thing that's different between this tax collector and Pharisee is the condition of their heart. People in Jesus' day would have been very surprised to see a respected religious professional showing arrogance the way Jesus sets this up. Jesus is taking these characters and turning them around and taking the assumptions about characters and setting it all on its ear. This parable is a little slice of life, and at the end of it, the tax collector comes out looking good to us. For the people who heard it, this would have been a very surprising upset because Jesus is working against uh, uh, our understandings and our, well, assumptions about characters, especially the tax collectors. First century Jews are on the sides of the Pharisees. The Pharisees come from good stock. They care about the future of God's people. They've spent time and energy studying the law of God. They're working at preserving Jewish identity as it slams up against Roman and Hellenistic impulses. Rome and Greek are trying to hold the Jews down. The Pharisees are saying, no, no, no. Tax collectors, on the other hand, are robbing the people, skimming off the top of the collections for themselves, and they were in cahoots with the Roman Empire. At best, they're just thieves, and at worst, they're thieves and traitors. So, to the original hearers of Jesus' parable, there's, it, it, it's completely startling. The Pharisee is not justified. The Pharisee is the star of our people. The tax collector is. He's a thief or a traitor. What are you doing, Jesus? So the question might be, why are we showing what's going on behind the curtain? Why are we getting a peek backstage? The Pharisee was not so much grateful to God 
as he was grateful only when he compared himself, himself to others. Because the moment we begin to stack up our own lives against the lives of people around us, it doesn't take long before the focus becomes what we do, how we act, what we perform. That in tendency within us to be self-centered, when we compare ourselves to others, woo, it becomes a, a tornado of self-centeredness. The shape of our lives, all those activities in which we engage that give our life shape, they become a taking off point in the way we start assessing our lives when we compare it to other people. Amy Jill Levine wrote a book called The Misunderstood Jew. And she says this about this particular parable. By forcing readers to see something positive about the tax collector, this parable insists that even those who work for the enemy may still be a part of the congregation. That even those who exploit members of their own community deserve consideration. Perhaps they, like in the coming parable or the coming story about Zacchaeus, are just doing the best they can while trapped in an impossible situation. They're damned if they do, they're damned if they don't. In other words, according to Amy Jill Levine, the parable forces those who hear it to walk in the shoes of the criminal or the ostracized. So what's the point of this switcheroo that Jesus is doing? Well, for one thing, it teaches us empathy. It teaches us to listen, learn to listen to others without first getting our arguments in order about why they're wrong before they even say anything. I think in a lot of ways this speaks to the uh, animosity in our culture right now. Because when you hear something coming over the, the, uh, over the news and you hear it's about those people, of course our first thought is, of course it's those people. And then we're doing the exact same thing that the Pharisee was doing in the parable. Them. Othering. Thank God I'm not them. So this twisting this all around and saying that they are noticed by Jesus and are given consideration by the God of life, takes us down off of our high horse a little bit. The other thing that this switcheroo might do is teach us the nature of grace and mercy. While the tax collector is justified, the overly confident Pharisee is also still a part of the community. The lead-in to the parable sets this up. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. And who are the righteous who consider others with contempt? This group needs to get their minds right and change the direction of their persistence from arrogance to humility. But the parable is also for those who refuse to trust that God can work in their lives because of who they are and what they have done. They also need to get their minds right and change the direction of their persistence perspective from perpetual self-deprecation to a recognition that they are a child of God. But I think maybe the reason Jesus does this topsy-turvy consideration of a justified that we would usually consider Pharisee to actually the justification being in the tax collector is because we need to learn to trust fully and thoroughly even as we breathe. Think of it like this. Jesus is attempting to get us to live in a way that our very lives testify to what God has done in our lives. Eugene Peterson, writing in uh, Galatians, 
chapter 5 in his paraphrase the message says that we are to show affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. That's his paraphrase of the nine spiritual fruits. The, uh, the, the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Oh, I wish I hadn't done that because now I can't remember the last four. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. Oh, yes, the fruit of the Spirit is the, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There we go. I have to sing the song. <laughs> but I just love the way he says, affection for others, abundance about life. Exuberance about life, serenity, a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, conviction that a basic holiness permeates all things and all people. Finding ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. If that could fit on a bumper sticker, I would have it on my car. In other words, our discipleship, the way we follow after Jesus is to have all the characteristics of children at play. Now think about that. What is the work that children do? They play. And play is work because play teaches them who they are, where their boundaries are, how to negotiate with other playmates, and what the rules are, and whether rules are worth following or whether they've just been made up to... Uh, uh, at the expense of younger siblings for the expense of older siblings, and no, I'm not having flashbacks to my own childhood here. <clears throat> Elizabeth Meyer, writing at a blog called Salt, says, we think of play as a specialty of young children, fully trusting and dependent on the love and care of their parents and guardians. Children can play when they feel secure, Ideally, it's unabashed and it's unselfconscious, and they are unabashed and unselfconscious about depending on that trust. They know who they can trust. They aren't trying to climb up into their parents' love, not hauling on that rope like the Pharisee was doing. Rather, their parents' love is the starting point for all their play. It's the foundation. It's the ground on which they stand. I think that's what Jesus is trying to get at with this topsy-turvy parable. We think we know who it is that's always justified, but he says, no, no, don't assume. Don't assume, because I see your heart. I know your heart. And if you think you're justified, I can tell you a few things about yourself. If you think you're a worm, I can tell you a few things about yourself. Here is my love. Use that as the way to base all of your interactions with one another and with God. Let go of pretense. Let go of assumptions. And receive God's kingdom as a child would receive it. A delightful undeserved gift. The good news of the gospel is that salvation isn't your work to do. It's God's work, and God's done it. And God loves you as a parent loves her children. Thank God. Amen.